as you mentioned, what we are aiming to do here is to create a system outside the boundaries of uh, nation states and traditional governments that is able to provide a stream of cash for uh, uh, every potentially everyone on the planet. How are you doing, Santi? How's everything going? All good, all good. I'm I'm here in Spain. Um, you, you know, you're having my usual routine working. Awesome, awesome. So to just give a small introduction of Santi from what I know, then like, you know, we'll give it to Santi to uh, introduce himself. Santi uh, is building UBI.eth, which is like universal basic income on uh, the Ethereum blockchain. If uh, and, uh, anyone who ha- doesn't know what UBI is, is basically uh, an unconditional uh, f- f- a sum of amount you get just for existing, which I honestly think is a beautiful concept. Uh, Sandy is doing this via proof of humanity, but he has uh, more of, like he's worked on different, different things like democracy, Earth and what on Santi? Yeah, w- would you like to uh, add on to this? Yes, absolutely. So, um, UBI, as you mentioned, this uh, about universal basic income. Uh, it's a it's a very very interesting project because, as you mentioned, what we are aiming to do here is to create a system outside the boundaries of uh, nation states and traditional governments that is able to provide a stream of cash for uh, uh, every potentially everyone on the planet. Um, of course, in order to get there, there are a lot of challenges, scalability uh, challenges, uh, user interface or user experience challenges, um, and uh, obviously a very long road in order to mm, is, uh, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, it got muted. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Just let me, I'm connecting my AirPods real quick. Just as, oh, oh there, no much problem. better. Now I can hear you better. Uh-huh. So, uh, awesome. I, I, one of the interesting things about the modern internet is that uh, we can uh, re- really think about applications that use finances in very novel ways. And uh, I think that that's the use cases for Ethereum or for blockchains in general expand as we're able to have more scalability lower gas costs uh, and better user experiences. Um, I think that there's definitely a place for crypto UBI to thrive. Um, the, the thesis around UBI is, is uh, actually comes from researchers and thinkers from all, all sides of the ideological spectrum. But you will find people like Milton Friedman or Frederick Hayek that were huge supporters of the idea of a negative income tax or sort of a tax in reverse. Uh, by basically uh, detailing that the problem of poverty around the world is basically a problem of lack of cash. And uh, the exciting thing about crypto is that if we are able to think of technological solutions that can uh, assure that everyone, regardless of where they were born, uh, and regardless of the limitations of your local currency, uh, get everyone on board into a system where they can get the basic their basic needs for living covered. I think that would be a, an incredible achievement of the modern internet, and, and I think you know that's that's the core mission of of UBI uh, at its at its heart. It's really trying to address the problem of, of global poverty through the use of these new networks like Ethereum and, and blockchains in general. Awesome, and so I just want to ask you. Um, just uh, for clarification, uh, people always critic UBI as like, you know, hey, if if someone is getting free money, they will will not work or like, you know, they'll become lazy. Uh, but uh, I think uh, what what do you say to such people? Well, it's basic, right? It's universal basic income. It's not your full income. It's not like giving you a full salary, it's giving you money enough to be make sure that you can afford uh, buying food, that you can afford uh, basic housing, uh, and uh, make sure that everyone has the same starting line. Um, it's not about giving you a full salary. It's very easy to uh, do a reductio ad absurdum, like take the argument to the absurd in order to attack the idea. And that's 
like really entire, entirely missing the point. Uh, we live in a world where there are huge income inequalities uh, and it's basically a massive lottery. If you are born in, say, Connecticut, you will live through a very different reality than if you are born in Argentina or in, I don't know, China or, or Japan or Africa. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, the income realities of each country are very diverse. We have we live in a very unequal world. But the exciting thing about the internet and its decentralization ethos is that we can really uh, start thinking about economic systems that uh, are not restricted by jurisdictions or by national policies regarding currency. And the, the goal with UBI um, is to you know address like a growing problem that we will be facing with technology in the coming decades and in the coming years. Um, technology is fast is vastly advancing at, at a very rapid pace uh, into artificial intelligence, into robotics, into all kinds of automation, which bring uh, to society a lot of efficiency in terms of prices, bring to society a lot of security, autonomous self-driving cars are probably much safer than trucks or, or, or big cars driven by human beings. And we can avoid all kinds of accidents and all kinds of situations. But the other side of the coin of the advancement of modern uh, robotics and artificial intelligence is that it will generate a lot of uh, job displacements. Uh, we have seen during the last decade, for example, how Uber opened up offices uh, around the world and it ha had a huge clash on every major city with the main uh, uh, unions of uh, taxi drivers or truck drivers. And this problem is only going to worsen up as, as AI and, and robotics improve. So uh, very recently, actually, Elon Musk, when he introduced the idea of developing a line of androids with uh, Tesla, he actually mentioned the relevance of UBI in order to uh, deal with, with the job offset rather than the carbon offset that uh, this new technology will generate. And... Um, if we are going to be advanced, advancing into, into these very promising technologies, uh, I think it's very relevant that we start thinking about how this can have uh, an, uh, an impact in society and civilization at large that it's not so, uh, that, that doesn't stress people out of their possibilities or out of their, or, or, or out of their uh, working capacity. Um, so uh, I think that it's, uh, you know, the fact that we can enable uh, a universal basic income using nothing but crypto primitives uh, and uh, enabling access to that to anyone that is able to connect to the Internet with a smartphone. Um, I think that's a very promising idea because it will help, uh, like we have seen during the first year of UBI, uh, it can help families, it can help people in developing countries uh, that would otherwise do not would not have the same advantages or, or privileges of those being born in, in developed nations. Um, with, with UBI, right now we have a very large community in Latin America, but it is particularly uh, impressive the size of the community in countries like Argentina, where you have very high inflation, um, in countries like Cuba, where you have international sanctions. And uh, with UBI, we are, we're providing entire families with a, with a source of income that is several times uh, more than the minimum wage over there. And uh, to me, the fact that we can create level playing field technology that really helps to put everyone on the same starting line moving forward, uh, it's, a, it's a very promising goal of what blockchains can achieve. Uh, we have seen during the first decade of Bitcoin and Ethereum to we have seen the rise of decentralized finance, the rise of NFTs, the rise of DAOs. Um, but as we expand the scalability of these networks, I think that we will definitely see more social like applications. And when we talk about social applications in this context, it's not just social media, it's really about uh, impacting people's pockets. And uh, UBI is probably the killer social application. Uh, for any blockchain moving forward, I think that in the future, uh, you know, those blockchains that do not allow for a, or do not have a UBI scheme uh, implemented will be simply missing 
a very relevant kind of, fu- of, of feature. Um, that's why I think, you know, Vitalik Buterin himself, he got very excited about UVI uh, very early on. He's actually the largest holder of UVI himself. Um, and every time that he has bought, uh, it's very it's very touching to see how with a simple transaction happening on Ethereum, he's automatically impacting the lives of the thousands of users we have onboarded on Proof of Humanity. And uh, the fact that we can do that kind of direct impact of cash, that that permissionless and disintermediated impact of cash straight into people's pockets without any clientelism, without any political intermediaries, um, I think it's a, a fantastic technology that can render obsolete a lot of the local political actors that usually intermediate between the state and uh, and, and the people. Uh, in, and usually they do it in exchange of political favors, like a vote or something. So uh, I'm, I'm very bullish on UBI. I think uh, first and foremost is a project that has a thriving community uh, that has been building on top of it, creating all kinds of uh, from uh, artistic NFT airdrops to uh, you know, improvements into the version two of the contract, which is uh, a very exciting innovation that is currently being under development right now that extends the streaming capacity of the token uh, and will enable new forms of uh, cryptocurrency that uh, in, that operates in real time uh, and can operate across multiple chains. So it's... Um, uh, to me, it's exciting to see the commitment of the community, the contributions that have been happening throughout our first year. It's a very young uh, project. Uh, it's only one year old. Um, but, you know, I, I learned last week that, you know, tomorrow 100 people will be gathering in a bar in Buenos Aires to talk about the UVI. And uh, to me, that remembers me, reminds me of how the early days of Bitcoin and Ethereum were where the first meetups were happening in, in towns like Buenos Aires and you know a, a couple a couple you know 20 or 50 people came to the meetups uh, and the same thing is happening with with UBI um, of course there are many challenges to the tokenomics to the to the to the features to the technical aspects of the token I'm happy to talk about, uh, about all of those um, but uh, I think that crypto UBI is an idea that is here to stay This podcast was possible because of our sponsors, Brave and Unstoppable Domains. More about them next. Crypto scams are like box of chocolates. You never know which one you're gonna get. Especially if you're using a crypto wallet, which is a browser extension. You run the risk of attacks like phishing scams, account spoofing, data leaks, and theft. The best way to avoid getting attacked is using Brave Wallet. Brave Wallet is the first secure crypto wallet built directly into a browser, so no extensions required. With Brave Wallet, you can buy, store, send, and swap assets. You can even manage your portfolio and NFTs all in one place. Whether you're new to crypto or a seasoned pro, it's time to switch to Brave Wallet. Download Brave at brave.com slash web3 with D and click the wallet icon to get started. You know what's the worst part about crypto? These long and complex wallet addresses. They can get so confusing. I know, you hate them too. What if I told you I replaced my long wallet address with dhirajshah.nft? Yeah, that's my name. All thanks to Unstoppable Domains, they're the number one providers of NFT domains. With Unstoppable Domains, you don't have to worry about renewal fees because you get to keep your NFT domain forever. You can get an NFT domain as well, maybe a .crypto, .nft, .x or something else. Go to unstoppabledomains.com right now and get your NFTs for as low as $5. I would like to uh, congratulate and say like congratulations on one year of UBI. Uh, it feels like it's been here for a really long time <laughs> and it still feels like, uh, like, you know, we are so early that like not a lot of people have adopted. Uh, I just want to ask uh, a little bit about Argentina uh, and like, you know, your 
like because you said that like a lot of users of UBI are from Argentina and countries like Cuba. What happens when we are living in some different country? Uh, I think most of the ecosystem is from like a US and whatnot, yes. and like. Yeah. So, and I'm from India, and like a lot of us have no clue what's happening in Argentina and uh, Cuba. Why are like the adoptions higher there? Great, great question, and and it's fantastic. We actually also have a, a nice community in India, and it's a country that I'm been dying to visit uh, for a long time. So, hopefully, one day we'll we'll be able to meet there. Uh, but like uh, like India, Latin America is a developing region. Uh, that has a lot of uh, um, that has a lot of countries that are struggling with you know uh, a very difficult financial reality. Um, countries like Argentina, for instance, are very famous in the region and worldwide to have a you know practically a dead currency. We don't have a national currency, or we sort of have it, but our annual inflation rate is fifty percent a year. So our currency reduces half of its value in one year, and this has been going on at least for the last five years, and probably in the last 20 years, like a growing rate of inflation. Um, and uh, obviously, this has led to Argentinians to really look for alternatives. Um, uh, the country's, the current government does not allow buying US dollars. It is forbidden to buy foreign currency. So uh, this means that you cannot save on any <laughs> on, on, an, on a different asset from our own. And our, our value is being stolen, you know, half of our value is being stolen by the government every year. So um, this has led to a lot of people in Argentina, for instance, looking into alternatives uh, like crypto. Crypto has become actually significantly large in the in the country uh, because of this reality, because it is forbidden to buy uh, US dollars, because we have capital controls, because there's... Uh, in, in international prices, energy is uh, subsidized in Argentina, so it's relatively cheap, which means people uh, can mine at home at a very profitable uh, rate. And, um, and the fact that you know, US dollars are forbidden to buy and the high inflation rate, this has led to an explosive adoption of crypto in the region, which can be seen not only at the user level, which is significant, and we had Vitalik visiting the country last year, and he had... Uh, uh, the status of a world-class celebrity being uh, in the media all day or you know all the major leadership of the of the country wanted to meet with him and he had sort of a, a Mick Jagger celebrity like status uh, and this is because user adoption is very high in Argentina but not only at the user level we see this incredible adoption but also at the developer level uh, Argentina in the last, because of this reality, uh, in the last couple of years or in the last decade has produced some of the most relevant contributions to the Ethereum project uh, through companies like Open Zeppelin, which are the largest auditors of smart contracts in the world. Um, there are stories that connect India and Argentina in crypto, like uh, one of the founders of Polygon from India actually came to ETH Buenos Aires to meet with the guys of Decentraland that were doing the first... Uh, crypto-enabled metaverse, uh, which is one of the largest projects also coming out of Argentina. And, uh, you know, he got the, the ideas on how to build and develop Polygon uh, after meeting Esteban Ordano of Decentraland. Uh, so the, the developer quality, the programmer quality in Argentina has uh, making strides in the Ethereum ecosystem. I've been living abroad for the last seven years, but every time I went to an Ethereum conference, whether in Osaka or in Prague or in the U.S., um, I think that it, it always made me proud to hear uh, how relevant some of the projects being born in Argentina or being started by Argentine founders were. And I think this is simply because of this reality that we are embedded with of uh, high inflation and uh, uh, that has led to a generation of engineers to, rather than wait for answers from the government, start building technology that can help everyone uh, around them and, and their local community. Um, so the entrepreneurial and the developer uh, sector of the country has been very innovative in what uh, in regarding crypto. And uh, I think it's no accident that also proof of humanity and UBI uh, is connected to Argentine talent. Other countries in Latin America face a very similar reality. 
you will have the case of Venezuela. Venezuela has had the highest inflation rate uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, practically now, Venezuela is a semi-dollarized economy. Uh, the currency is completely dead. Um, then you have countries like Cuba that have been overtaken by a communist revolution in, the, in, in 1959. And for the last uh, 50, 60 years, they have been trapped uh, by international sanctions. Uh, they have suffered uh, isolation from the financial world in its entirety. And suddenly, you know, discovering Cubans uh, sanctioned by the U.S. Uh, to be able to be connected to a global economy through the use of crypto uh, is a very powerful thing. It makes me very proud the fact that UBI has been successful in developing countries more than, the, than in the U.S. or in Europe. Even though we have prominent users in the U.S. like uh, Alexis Ohanian or some major uh, entrepreneurs and, 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 and figures from the technology scene over there. But uh, it, I think that ultimately we want to see UBI helping out those who need first, uh, even though we make sure that the U U UBI also matters because we don't want to build a, a list of people, of poor people that can be a stigmatizing list. So we have some billionaires actually in our list uh, living together with, with people that come from you know, areas or parts of the world that are much more in need than, than, than the you know, wealthy people. Uh, so we are all bringing them together through the use of proof of humanity, which is a decentralized identity protocol. Um, and uh, once you are verified on proof of humanity, you start uh, receiving a stream of UBI tokens straight into your uh, MetaMask or Ethereum wallet. And uh, that's, that's one of the cool things about UBI. It's, it's the first token out there in the market that streams itself. And this streaming capacity is very, very powerful because it, first, it saves people a lot of gas. It actually costs zero gas to have a streaming, uh, a streaming token. Um, second, you get uh, you know, one UBI per hour or 0.00028 UBI per second. Um, and uh, you know, it's not just a token and it's not just you know, uh, uh, an asset that you move around. It's a living stream as long as you are verified as a human being on proof of humanity. And this streaming capacity, we are actually extending it on UBI version 2, which is being developed by a, by a very gifted developer called Juan Aedo, uh, who has been helping me out in the, in the design and the development of UBI version 2. He's doing God's work right now. And uh, he's extending the features, the streaming features of UBI, where you can... Um, the stream that you receive, uh, you can split up that stream and, and send a percentage of your stream to someone else. So we will be able to start having like a real time money economy uh, where, money, where money moves in real time through the use of streams. Uh, and this can allow for new use cases in crypto like subscription models or uh, using future accrual of UBI as collateral uh, and, I, and I'm sure that we will see many more things that we just don't know just yet. Um, and uh, another cool thing about how streams work is that each stream that you produce uh, with your UBI stream, each stream itself is an NFT, uh, will be formalized as an NFT contract. So you will be able to actually trade <laughs> as, as NFTs the different streams that you generate with your with your original stream received uh, by verifying yourself on proof of humanity. So uh, this be beyond just, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how this technology of stream cash uh, is evolving, uh, is improving, and uh, is bringing to the general crypto scene uh, features and ways of thinking about money that are completely novel. And, um, you know, the, the, the main challenge for us is to make sure that uh, on proof of humanity or you know, in any other kind of uh, humanity attestation service that we might use in the future, uh, to make sure that you know, we don't have uh, duplicate identities or robots or civils uh, present in the registry. That's, that's the critical aspect. As long as we are solid with the verification of human beings in the registry uh, and proof of humanity, I think that's an extraordinary job at that. Uh, and it's probably the best on-chain attestation we have on Ethereum right now. 
uh, with that in place, uh, we we really can uh, think of a, a UBI scheme that's fair for everyone, and that you know, uh, I, I I have a lot of stories about last year. Uh, you know, when when suddenly Vitalik made a big buy of of uh, UBI, uh, you know, I, I started receiving stories from people who were able to visit their parents after two years of a pandemic for because of the income they received through UBI and they were able to afford the plane tickets. I received stories from students that were able to pay their student debt uh, in the university. Um, and what seems to be what seemed to be a theory about UBI suddenly became a reality about UBI to me. Like the reality of it is very powerful because a uh, hundred dollars a month, or fifty dollars a month, or five hundred dollars a month, uh, in most places is a lot of money, uh, and with a very little help like that, can really go the distance and improve uh, people's lives uh, in a in a significant way. Uh, so the challenge now for us as a community, the UBI and proof of humanity community is to understand how to keep bootstrapping this project and growing its impact around the world. Uh, we have a very long way to go, but uh, I, the, the exciting thing is that in Ethereum, I think there are a lot of supporters of the UBI idea out there. And the more we are able to collaborate and cooperate with open source uh, software, uh, the, the, the farther we can get uh, on the creation of this reality. Hey, that's that's uh, really awesome, and thank you for uh, sharing that story. Uh, I I mean, I just want to just clarify to the people who are new and like who don't know what what is going on is basically uh, UBI allows you to go like you know you can go to proof of humanity. Just you have to. Um, make sure uh, that you register there and do a verification check um, and you don't need any government ID you don't need anything because like you know it's irrelevant you just have to verify your uh, ethereum address by posting a video and there are some checks and if if that is verified and someone vouches uh, for you uh, per month uh, you get sorry every hour you get one UBI token, which is worth 0 0.04 cents. But like when you compound it into like a monthly thing, you can earn up to $32. This is for just existing, right? Like this is crazy. And like the prices go up and down. So like as Santi was mentioning, when Vitalik, Vitalik bought uh, a bunch of these tokens a lot of people sold to fund uh, their trips <laughs> maybe not trips but like you know the education and whatnot uh, so this is quite uh, and honestly uh, even that amount Santi is a, a huge amount in India yeah right like yeah you can eat for the entire month like you can feed your entire family if you buy fruits and vegetables and whatnot so <sighs> Yeah, that that's pretty cool, Sandy. You could have been doing anything uh, on the Ethereum blockchain, and you would have made a shit ton of money. Uh, because like you know, every every dev or every project here is like you know making uh, life changing money. Why did you pick UBI, and like you know, why are you spending all your time and effort building this? So. Uh, I think that, you know, I've been involved in crypto very early on, since 2011, uh, when I found out about Bitcoin, and uh, probably with Ethereum since 2017. And, um, you know, I've been, I've been relatively successful with my own investments in, in this area and, and in general. So I am not in the pursuit of uh, making more money uh, myself personally. But ultimately, when you think about wealth, uh, I think that if you become wealthy alone, uh, you are not really wealthy. You are just uh, like Monty Burns in The Simpsons, uh, alone and isolated in your ivory tower from everyone else. Uh, and I think that you know, real wealth is when you are able to improve the quality of life of everyone in your community or everyone in your country, in your city, and why not everyone in the planet? And um, I think that we have seen in the last decade a tremendous amount of wealth being created with crypto, uh, you know, from zero to a couple trillion dollars in 
almost 10 years. And that's really extraordinary. And everyone who has been paying attention to these technologies, I'm sure they have made a, a significant return on their investments. But uh, I am myself not a, an investor, not a, a trader. Uh, I, don't, I don't enjoy that game as much, to be honest. I'm just a software developer. I can uh, sit down and program something on a, any given day. And just that's why what I simply enjoy the most doing since I was a young, a young child. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole idea about doing a, a universal basic income token, you know, it was kind of like a, a consequence of the research and the work uh, I have been work doing over the last 10 years. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I am, in Argentina, I actually started a political party called Partido de la Red uh, or the Net Party, where we were trying to figure out how to do democracy over the Internet, like a fair voting system over the Internet. And uh, we have been implementing democratic pilots all over the world. And it became very clear uh, the more we understood you know, what it would take to do a democracy over the Internet that identity is the mother of all battles. It's really, uh, like Edward Snowden once uh, said, it's the one vulnerability being exploited across all systems. Uh, so understanding how to do identity in a decentralized way became like a very big deal for us. Uh, and when I say us, I mean the, the Democracy Earth Foundation, which is an organization I preside that it's about figuring out how to do what democracy is in the information age. And uh, the more we understood the problem of uh, online voting, the more clear it became that you know whoever controls the registry of identities can tamper and decide the outcome of an election. So uh, how could we actually create a registry of identities where uh, each individual member controls their own identity, but no one can control the registry uh, as a whole? And uh, that led to the creation of Proof of Humanity when we partnered up with Kleros, uh, which is another great project that has contributed a significant component to, to Proof of Humanity and, and to the development of Proof of Humanity itself. And, um, and uh, you know, once you understand how, that you are formalizing human rights on the blockchain, uh, that, that primitive of being able to signal whether or not an address corresponds to a unique human, uh, it's a primitive that you can use to build all kinds of applications. Uh, democracy is one of them, which is where, what got us started into this, but universal basic income is another one. And it's a very important one, maybe a very transcendent one because it, it addresses a very pressing problem like uh, the issue of uh, lack of funds or lack of cash and poverty and inequality uh, around the world. So um, when we launched a, uh, when we launched the uh, Proof of Humanity, we did it with UBI as a, as the as a way that would would be beneficial to everyone in the sense that uh, for people to register in Proof of Humanity, UBI is an incentive to do it, uh, being able to have this income so they can experience uh, crypto applications and get a, a little bit of cash in their pockets to test out different stuff. Uh, like the incentive of UBI works to get people onboarded into Proof of Humanity. And at the same time, something like UBI requires uh, an attestation of human beings uh, that cannot be corrupted, uh, that cannot be tampered with. Uh, so we avoid uh, having the UBI uh, Ill, like being transferred to identities that, we might, uh, that might not be uh, real identities or that might not be uh, or, or that could be tampered by an organization or a single authority. So um, making making this this thing a reality took a lot of effort, a lot of years of research, uh, a lot of uh, you know we, we, you you can check on democracy dot earth uh, the papers that we have written about the subject since 2017, uh, and uh, you know how how it has been evolving throughout the years. Um, I can go back as back as to, to back to like even 2015 when my daughter was born and we, and, you know, I did her birth certificate using the Bitcoin blockchain back then. And these were all early prototypes of understanding how to uh, formalize human identity on the blockchain. 
And, and when we talk about you know human, human identity, we are really talking about human rights. Um, we live in a world where one billion people do not have any kind of identity credential. Uh, they are born in areas or regions where the government simply doesn't care or the, their families didn't care. And, and this is a very common reality uh, in Latin America and I'm sure in India as well. And to be able to provide the right to identity in a permissionless way through censorship resistant networks, I think holds tremendous promise for building a better world in the future. Um, we can onboard, like you mentioned uh, before, you are not required to give any uh, information about yourself, like legal information or government related information. It's just a 10 second video uh, that will be used to compare your face to other faces. And that's about it. And once you do that, uh, you'll have a stream of cash being uh, sent straight into your, into your crypto wallet. Um, one of the reasons Vitalik likes uh, UBI, uh, that I, I've heard him mention this uh, several times, is that uh, it's a great onboarding mechanism to crypto that does not rely on traditional banks or traditional organizations. Still to this day, most of the onboarding on crypto is uh, done through exchanges. And when you go into exchange, you probably have to go through a KYC. And if you have to go through a KYC, it's all about you know engaging with the traditional banking system. And probably a lot of people get, get left out because uh, of simply that fact, because they are not bankerized and they are not part of the banking system and they simply do not pass the KYC. Uh, whereas with proof of humanity and, and UBI, uh, it's a way of having people to get their first, uh, to get an identity in crypto and uh, to start getting a, a stream of cash that they can use to start interacting with the, with the blockchain. And um, it's, it's you know, an onboarding mechanism that is completely organic to how crypto works. Of course, there are a lot of aspects of the protocol that can and will be improved. But um, uh, I think that you know, giving people a little bit of cash so they can start experimenting with DeFi or with the different applications that are on, on the blockchain uh, is, is a great way to get things started for, for a lot of users. And, and you know, I think that's, you know, this is what, you know, one of the main arguments of uh, why, why Vitalik likes uh, what we have done with uh, POH and, and UVI. Wow. So I like uh, uh, I like Santi you answering all these questions me before asking you because <laughs> I wanted to ask to me <laughs> a little bit. About, it's a pleasure like, to do this in uh, English because I usually give these interviews in Spanish. <laughs> 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 no, no, no problem. Thank you for sharing. Uh, guys, we, we will take the request and uh, questions in a while. Uh, like I've gotten this chance to speak to Santi, so I'm going to use it to max to pick his brains. Uh, so Santi, I mean, you know, what, what you said that got me really thinking is... Uh, how many people don't have any kind of government documentation and honestly i have i, I have no clue because uh, like i mean i know the number is very high but like we generally don't understand what happens because like you know we are in our own bubble so um, how is the number so high like do governments not care enough to like you know get these people uh, documented or um or, and like what are these like what happens to these people if they can can't access the traditional finance system or any kind of uh, system per se so the and yeah 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 i i would also like to add uh, is uh, just thinking about this like if you don't have any kind of document let's say if you're in us you don't have an ssn if you you're in india you don't have an aadhar card or something like that you don't get any benefits yeah like if, if there is social security or like you know a homeless uh, person how, how how are you going to prove that like you know i live here or i live there because everyone asks for a house address sorry santi go. yeah yeah i i'm familiar with the arbat system used in india which is probably one of the largest databases in the planet um <laughs> the which got leaked and was being sold for 25 dollars i remember that data. i remember that yeah <laughs> it's a huge security breach 
uh, and that's what that's one of the main problems of centralization, right? If uh, one person fucks up, uh, fucks it up for everyone. So um, the statistic of one one point one billion people not having an identity is actually uh, uh, a research that comes out of the World Bank. Uh, the World Bank, uh, you know, did a field field research and uh, really look into the situation. Uh, and got into this estimate number, which means basically one out of uh, every seven humans in the planet lack any kind of identity. Um, I thought this was an, uh, you know, a problem far away from home until you know, I, I visited some of the poorest neighborhoods in my own country or in, in Buenos Aires. And uh, I realized that you know, that's a reality that hits very close to home. Uh, when you visit uh, slums in, in Argentina, and I'm positive this must be a very similar situation in India, uh, 5 to 10% of the people over there uh, were never given any kind of identity uh, by the government uh, because uh, the government is simply not present in these neighborhoods because, uh, you know, some of these families, uh, you know, they, they, they did, did not care or they did not know that they had to register their child uh, under some kind of identity. Um, and there are a lot of inefficiencies to how social welfare can work in these uh, neighborhoods because of the lack of uh, formalization of identity uh, to, to a lot of these people. Um, so, um, you know, uh, fingerprinting everyone and, you know, being able to get some kind of biometric and creating a unified database at a very large scale, it's not an easy problem. It's actually a very hard problem. That's why Facebook might be uh, today the most, uh, the largest uh, <laughs> identity database in the world. Uh, Facebook is like, it reaches 3 billion people uh, all over the West um, or the Western world, I should say. Uh, and similar to the Chinese Communist Party, which probably reaches a billion people in China. Um, but uh, when you build centralized systems like this, uh, this also means that these systems can be used for surveillance, for tracking your activity, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, this information in the wrong hands can be used for identity theft. Uh, and, you know, working with identities, working with a very sensitive piece of information that, you know, can uh, enable uh, a lot of things to a lot of people. So, um it's it's uh, I think it's a huge problem uh, in the camp of decentralization. Uh, we are in a in, in very very uh, at a very young stage of how we are actually solving this problem. Um, Proof of Humanity right now has fifteen thousand verified humans, um, which uh, is not a significant number when you compare it to Web two uh, metrics. Uh, but when you compare it with other protocols or with other decentralized ID protocols, uh, it's probably one of the largest decentralized identity protocols in existence. Uh, some other projects like Proof of Humanity out there that exist are IDENA, uh, which is a project that was born in Russia, uh, and they use uh, uh, synchronous Turing tests to uh, make an attestation of people's attention, uh, which is a very interesting and a very original approach to the problem. And IDENA has, uh, last time I checked, it's around 12,000, 13,000 nodes, something like that. Uh, there, are, there are other protocols like Bright ID that use uh, 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 social graph calculations in order to, to estimate a probability of how likely a node might be, belong to a unique uh, member or not. Uh, so it's harder to audit how, how the identities operate in, in the Bright ID protocol, but I think last time I checked, they had a reach of almost 50,000 nodes or something like that. Um, so, you know, these are all different uh, attempts at trying to do decentralized identity through the use of uh, crypto economic incentives and blockchains. Um, there's a paper that I co-authored called Who Watches the Watchmen? You can find that paper on uh, democracy.earth. And that's a systemic review of seven different approaches to decentralized identity that we uh, research uh, prior to the launch of Proof of Humanity. Uh, so that will give you a glimpse into how difficult this problem of formalization of identity is and what, uh, what it takes to actually do it the, the right way. Um, there are some new projects emerging out, of, uh, out there like WorldCoin. Uh, WorldCoin is doing proprietary hardware 
uh, which uh, in my personal opinion, it's a very bad idea because there is no accountability to how that hardware works. It's like a black box and you have no guarantees uh, of uh, um, at the end of the day, whether uh, the hashes of uh, corresponding to each person are actually unique or not. No one can audit in a permissionless way how the registry is being created, which leads to a lack of trust uh, in, in, in regards to how the, the, the registry happens. Um, permission, the ability to permissionlessly audit the, how the identities are created is very important uh, because it's the way you can have a guarantee that no single entity uh, might control a lot of uh, uh, identities in secret or uh, without revealing them. So the proof of humanity is a registry that you can, you know, you can go into proofofhumanity.id, launch the app, and you can immediately audit uh, uh, all of the identities that are available in the in the open registry. And you can look at the videos, and if you identify, if you identify. Uh, you know, a, a person that looks exactly the same like uh, another person on the video, then you can challenge that and request the removal of that identity in the registry. And everyone is allowed to do that. Everyone has the right to become like a, a small brother or a, or a little brother, which is a concept that we use in our original paper in 2017, rather than having one large uh, big brother uh, having the ultimate word about uh, who gets to be or who doesn't get to be in the registry. Uh, so it's it's a very hard problem. We are barely getting started with how to address decentralization. This is a post Facebook technology uh, in the sense that Facebook became a monopoly that conquered our human rights uh, and privatized our, our human rights during the Web2 legacy era. And uh, with Proof of Humanity, we are also very cautious of making uh, engineering uh, choices and, and design choices in how the protocol works that uh, makes sure that we avoid uh, the path of uh, repeating the, the same mistakes that uh, Facebook did or uh, like the large big tech companies of Silicon Valley did in the past. Um, the web protocol, uh, fantastic idea by Sultan Berners-Lee, uh, born out of the CERN laboratory in Europe uh, to connect academic articles with hyperlinks and he developed HTTP and HTML. And we live in an exciting world uh, on the internet thanks to the web that became its killer protocol. But the web uh, had two very important uh, uh, features that were never uh, formalized. Uh, one of them is uh, the web lacks privacy, like the privacy layer of the web was an afterthought uh, and some security uh, certificates and, and encryption certificates were developed afterwards, but the web formally never had any privacy in its original design. And the other aspect that the web misses is identity. Uh, the web never formalized a human identity in any way, which led to the capture of that aspect by a handful of Silicon Valley monopolies. So um, uh, don't get me wrong, I think that obviously a lot of progress and a lot of innovation happened in the last 30 years thanks to the web. But uh, moving forward, uh, considering how important the internet is into our uh, daily interactions uh, uh, with the world, uh, the fact that human rights are uh, currently subject to a, the interest of a private company in the US does not speak very well about uh, how the politics of the internet look like in the world today. And with Proof of Humanity, the idea is to develop uh, an open system, an open standard that can be controlled by a community in a democratic way. Uh, Proof of Humanity is actually the very first democratic DAO in Ethereum, where every single vote, we have over 40 proposals voted last year. Um, every single proposal is voted democratically, uh, one person, one vote, and we use liquid democracy, so you can delegate your vote to someone else if you don't have the time to commit to the, the, to the DAO. And uh, I'm proud to say that, you know, we have been able to sort out urgent needs and, and, and critical uh, 
uh, organization aspects of our community uh, through the use of democracy in a very pure way, a very pure version of democracy. A uh, democracy that is hard to corrupt, a democracy with decentralized identities, uh, with votes happening off-chain and enforced on-chain. And, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's uh, really striking that, you know, we're probably the only democratic DAO in existence in Ethereum today, but hopefully I think that other projects will follow suit in, in the coming years. And, and I'm sure that Proof of Humanity will help uh, to enable uh, further forms of governance to crypto projects out there. Awesome. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Sandy. I mean, before I ask the next question, I just want to say hi to our listeners and uh, uh, just want, like, if you guys are enjoying, if you guys are learning some, you guys are uh, having fun getting to know Santi. Uh, just, uh, like, make sure you retweet this space, tag me, tag Santi, and let us know your thoughts. Uh, so, like, you know, more and more people get to know about these spaces, uh, get to know about Proof of Humanity, get to know about Santi and the work they're doing. Uh, it's just amazing. And, uh, yeah, thank you for... Uh, all of you for like you know staying tuned and listening very carefully where you could have done anything else uh, or browsed or watched tiktok or something but like you guys are yo thank you for that uh, <laughs> santi um I, I mean let's let's talk a little bit about your uh, argentina trip which happened recently and you yes. were talking uh, uh, like you know you were talking about Vitalik and like you know him being like a huge supporter of uh, what you do and UBI so tell me like I mean you did anyway tell like you know why uh, he loves it but like how was it meeting Vitalik and uh, you said like he's bigger than the Hollywood like he's as big as like a Hollywood star in Argentina right like so how was that uh, for you just to see all that witness and like meeting him, talking to him. How was that experience? So um, I, I, I can show you that story from the beginning when, when I was chatting with Vitalik and he casually tells me, uh, oh, by the way, I'm going to be in Buenos Aires in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and I'm like, I live in Madrid, I live in Spain. And I'm like, uh, well, that's fantastic. That's amazing. You know, you're going to be visiting my country. Makes me super proud. Like, uh, you know, Vitalik is one of my personal heroes, as I'm sure it's the hero of many of, many of us here in this space today. And um, the fact that he was going to be visiting for the first time my country, uh, you know, made me very proud. Vitalik is a digital nomad. He travels around the world. Uh, he has been living like that for eight years. And finally, now he's curious about what's going on in Argentina. I assume because, you know, there are a lot of Argentines that appear on Ethereum conferences around the world. So I'm sure that he was curious to see what's actually going on there with the inflation and with the challenges that our country faces. So um, when, I, when I started mentioning to some friends of mine in Argentina that uh, Vitalik was going to be visiting the country, um, very early on, uh, my friends or a friend of mine actually told me, oh, if he's coming, uh, you know, the ex-president, uh, Mauricio Macri, who's, who was president of Argentina for, for uh, in between 2015 and 2019, uh, he, he might be interested in meeting him. And, uh, you know, it's not a very common thing to, to hear from a former president of the country to be interested in meeting a, 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 a global leader in, in crypto and, and, and this technology. So uh, very early on, I realized that, uh, you know, I, I, it would be an extraordinary opportunity uh, for Vitalik to discover the country from, from, you know, from the leadership of the country, and not just as a tourist. And, uh, you know, knowing Vitalik and knowing Argentina, I, I, I simply did not want to, to miss the opportunity to show Vitalik around to, and get him to to meet uh, as many cool people and interesting people from my country as possible. So uh, I made the trip to Buenos Aires in an expe unexpectedly because I was uh, probably preparing for Christmas uh, last year and I had to tell my family that they, uh, I wouldn't be at home in Christmas due to Vitalik's trip. Uh, but uh, the second I arrived to Buenos Aires, uh, you know, I, I'm also a tourist in my own city after seven years of living abroad. 
and I haven't been in Argentina since before the pandemic. So it's been two years since I've been there. And uh, very early on, it was very clear that something happened uh, with the country during the pandemic. Because, uh, for instance, the person that came to pick me up at the airport, uh, he mentioned me when, when he was driving me uh, to, to my home, to my parents' home. Uh, he, he mentioned me that he was uh, doing a side job of mining cryptocurrency on his spare time. And he was making a certain amount of income every month thanks to that. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, not, not, that's not really common. I think of the, the guy driving you to your home is like mining crypto. But uh, I thought that, well, maybe that's a weird coincidence until, you know, uh, we, we actually, the, the day I arrived, we went straight to pick up Vitalik because we had the meeting with the president. And, uh, you know, we did that meeting. Vitalik went there. Uh, uh, you know, he spent a full hour talking with the former president of Argentina, uh, and uh, you know when that uh, picture of Vitalik and Macri came came became public, the entire country was uh, asking who is Vitalik Buterin. Uh, it was a very powerful signal uh, to have uh, a very prominent leader of our political class to be willing to receive him because um, then the entire country pays attention to to someone like Vitalik Buterin. And, you know, that's, you know, what, what more could I ask for than for, you know, the people of my country to discover this brilliant mind, this very generous, very, very gifted, uh, a, a great thinker of our time. And, and for my, my friend Vitalik to discover, uh, you know, uh, how, how much Argentina needs his ideas and, and his wisdom and, and his technology. So, um, uh, very early on, it was like um, suddenly realizing that Argentina during the pandemic kind of like leveled up in crypto uh, in a general sense, because uh, I remember we went after to do a big uh, lunch with prominent uh, entrepreneurs and crypto people from the local community uh, uh, from Argentina. And then there, the, the waiter <laughs> asked, uh, for Vitalik, uh, asked Vitalik for a picture. Uh, and, uh, and the waiter told Vitalik that his, his son was mining crypto and he was into the subject. And then we, we went back to the, you know, to, to the place where Vitalik was staying. And this, you know, every time he walked over the streets, people recognized him. People knew who he was uh, and asked him like, hey, when Ethereum 2.0 is going to come out? Or like uh, they came and talked to him with like actual relevant questions about uh, the current reality of Ethereum and the roadmap and the merge and all of that. So to me, uh, I always told my friends after that trip that it felt like accidentally flying to like in back to the future to the year 2034. Like it felt like a very futuristic Buenos Aires where everyone and their mothers were, was mining crypto. Uh, and uh, because of the, interest that was captured by uh, the some by, by Vitalik by the people uh, of Argentina regarding the visit of Vitalik uh, suddenly we started receiving all kinds of invitations for him we received invitations from other political leaders from the government from the you know uh, activists uh, from very prominent business people of the country that were, you know, inviting him to go to the Patagonia on a private jet or, uh, you know, yeah, go to the, some of the most incredible places in the country. But obviously, you know, it was always Vitalik's choice what to do. And uh, during that visit, uh, we, in 48 hours, we prepared a conference for him. He did not want to make his trip very exclusive and only for himself. So he realized that people were very excited he was visiting the country and he asked me to do a conference. And in 48 hours, we pulled uh, an incredible, you know, we, we got an incredible theater in the city that allowed for a thousand people to, to be able to see him give a keynote of an hour and a half. And, uh, you know, it was amazing to see the country operate in such a, an efficient manner to make sure that we give Vitalik the best image possible of the city and, and, and the country. Uh, the conference he did sold out in three minutes. I never seen something like that in my entire career. Uh, like uh, I tweeted the flyer with announcing the, the day, place and time of the conference. 
And three minutes later, the Eventbrite link that sold the, the tickets uh, sold out, completely sold out, a thousand tickets. Uh, so uh, that really helps see, <laughs> like measure how impactful his visit was to the country. Um, then he met with the government. Uh, he met with the economic economy minister, uh, Martin Guzman, who back then was in a negotiation, very important negotiation with the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. And uh, I remember, you know, visiting the minister and, and telling Vitalik, you, you know, the, the IMF is more scared of you than, than the minister. So probably your picture with him will, will help Argentina a little bit with the negotiations. Uh, and, um, and then uh, Vitalik wanted to see the reality of the country and not just the tourist version of the country. So he was interested in visiting uh, a slum, uh, which is a, 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 a very, very, a, a very large neighborhood close to the wealthiest neighborhood of the country. Next to the wealthiest neighborhood of the country, there's this uh, very big slum for that where 50,000 people live. And uh, we arranged with the government uh, to, to visit that. Uh, and so he could see how those people living under the poverty line uh, live in Argentina. And uh, that was also a very special moment. We visited a school that was created by Pope Francis, uh, where young children learn to to play music, they learn to play sports, they, they do theater and all kinds of activities that help uh, bring the community together. And just, you know, watching Vitalik uh, interacting with the with the children and and with the youth of the school um, and learning about the reality, where they showed him some videos and they shared with him uh, some experiences, uh, was very moving. Um, I remember there was a a sixteen year old kid that came to to the meeting with five questions written handwritten uh, in a paper about Vitalik's life. Uh, he asked him about. Um, you know how it was to write for Bitcoin magazine, or like little details of Vitalik's life, and uh, Vitalik was very generous to offer uh, very, very uh, inspiring answers. And even you know in Spanish, uh, he talks uh, very fluent Spanish to to our surprise. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know it was uh, also very moving to to see how much he cared. Um, and you know he. I think he had a great time uh, when visiting Argentina, um, and I'm, I'm sure that you know he might come back in the future, uh, as he has made a, a lot of friends while while being there, and and the and the country definitely you know loves Ethereum, understands you know the power of smart contracts uh, more than you know more than Spain at least, which is what I can, uh, can compare with because I live in Spain and I definitely do not see the Spanish people as engaged uh, with crypto than, than the people in Argentina. So uh, it was a, a, a really fantastic experience and, and definitely a, a memory that I will, I will personally treasure the rest of my life. Wow. Thank you for sharing uh, the story. It's like a movie when you think of it, right? Like when you <laughs> all of this happening and like, you know, you telling your wife and kids uh, basically you're not going to be there for Christmas <laughs> because you have to spend time with Vitalik <laughs> and they're like what is this <laughs> happening or like no they support you but like you know you're pulling up a conference in few days and all this it's, it's just amazing right like I mean I don't know when all of this could happen and like you know feel uh, this good as well so uh I mean, Kino, I know you've been here since uh, the first minute. Uh, like, and I'm happy to take some questions as long as Santi uh, wants to. Uh, and, uh, like, you know, we can ask Santi some question. Kino, go for it. And, guys, if you want to ask any questions, please request. And, like I said, please share the spaces if you're enjoying. Kino. Um, Can guys hear me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so I. Kino, I just muted you uh, because there is some kind of white noise happening at your end, like dubstick music. All right. Yeah. So uh, um, 
I also live in Spain, by the way, and it's good to see people here uh, because the youth here is not very interested in technology. Um, so I have a few boring questions for you. I hope you want to answer them. Uh, my first question, I don't know if you talk about this, but how do you guys come up with all this liquidity? Because I was just making like easy calculations. If we have a thousand people for one year receiving the tokens, that's a mid eight million tokens. And like, was, or is it eight, six million tokens? I don't know. It's a lot. So how do you guys manage that? And also the, the project is on Ethereum. And I I, I, I researched Cl Clearos before Clearos before. And well, you have to pay some gas, right? To do the, the proof of humanity. And yeah, that's, uh, I have another follow-up question after this, but if you can tell me a little bit about that. Absolutely. And, and I, it's a great question. Um, yes, uh, the issuance of UVI is connected to every new human verified on proof of humanity. And for every new human on proof of humanity, one UVI per hour will be minted or generated through the stream. Actually, technically speaking, a minted token is once you transacted the UVI. If you have never transacted and the UVI is on the stream, uh, that's not accounted as a fully minted token, but uh, that's just a technicality. Um, but the, 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 you know, the, the tokenomics still apply. It's one UVI per hour per human. Um, if, you, if you look at the tokenomics of Dogecoin or like Shiv that issue 10,000 new Doges per second uh, per, uh, indefinitely forever, uh, I think we have a far less aggressive emission rate than some of those tokens. Uh, that said, uh, the critical thing for us is to avoid having an unfair amount of tokens generated, uh, meaning that you know we are issuing uh, twice the amount of tokens for a same identity or more than twice uh, the amount of tokens for a same identity. Like if we have civils in the registry, if we have robots in the registry, or if we have non-human actors in the registry in that are cheating the registry, that's a big problem for us. Um, we always focused uh, on the side of simplicity regarding the design of the token. Uh, you know, accruing one unit per hour is a much better user experience than accruing one unit per day or one unit per month. Uh, so we actually you know, had technical and user experience considerations other than just the financial considerations. And we decided, you know, we're going to work with that constraint. You know, this is the rule of the token. In the same way that Twitter has a rule that is only 140 characters per, per post, or now it's 280, we will have a constraint that it's, you know, UBI is simply a token or a protocol that will generate one new token for every new human uh, per hour, uh, as long as that human is verified on, on an attestation system like proof of humanity. Um, so working with that constraint means that we know the supply side of the equation, you know, that's completely predictable. Uh, and we have to make sure that no fake humans uh, engage in the registry, thus using something like proof of humanity makes plenty of sense. Um, but uh, the, the, you know, I think where your question points to is the demand side, you know, how we generate enough demand uh, to buy back tokens, to support the price level, uh, and to make sure that this is sustainable as we reach to 100,000 users or 100 million users. Yeah, that's exactly, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, first of all, the more users are on the list, uh, the lower the inflation rate becomes. So I give you just a back of the envelope example. If I have five users on the list and uh, I get one new user, that means that the you know the issuance rate has grown uh, at least twenty percent uh, with that new extra user in a list of six users. Um, but if I have a hundred thousand users and one new user uh, enters the list. Uh, the issuance rate is below 1% or even below 0.1%. So the, as, the, as the registry of humans becomes larger and larger, the relative issuance rate will become smaller and smaller in percentage terms. 
uh, this is a very counterintuitive thing, uh, but uh, it's it's part of the dynamic that we have as we are bootstrapping the network. Um, the more users we get initially, uh, the faster the the relative issuance rate will will become lowered. Um, of course, we're fifteen thousand users right now. Uh, if we get fifteen thousand users more, that doubles the issuance rate. Uh, but uh, uh, you know that's that's you know part of the bootstrapping process is uh, you know working with these constraints. Um, so I'm, I'm not you know when you compare the issuance rate with Dogecoin or with other projects that are highly inflationary, I'm not that concerned about about that as long as we are able to make sure that we don't have duplicate identities. On the demand side. And basically, what we are facing now is that we have to build an ecosystem around UBI. Uh, this ecosystem can consist of several kinds of applications. Uh, what we have seen during the first year of the of the project is that we have seen uh, NFT games that are building experiences uh, that uh, use uh, uh, you know a, a fee of the transactions to burn UBI tokens. Uh, why a game would be uh, interested in supporting UBI? Well, because it would turn that video game uh, into not just entertainment, but actually that something has some solidarity with the community. Uh, it will turn a pointless entertainment into something that actually, the more you play it, the more it benefits and impacts in a positive way to those receiving UBI. So um, any kind of game that wants to have a positive impact in the community and not just become shallow entertainment, uh, by allocating a percentage of the fees to burn UBI, uh, you know, completely redefines what how entertainment looks like uh, with with you know th through the use of NFTs or or something like that. And you know, I'm actually involved in a very large project related to this, which I'm happy to to share some details. Um, but you know, that's that's one angle that we can use. Another angle is uh, DeFi. DeFi. Uh, it's a, a very interesting field where there are a lot of uh, projects and protocols out there that generate yield over any given asset. So very early on on the UBI project, we actually collaborated with one of the YERN developers to do a couple of uh, what we call humanitarian vaults, where you can stake Ether or stake a stable coin. And that Ether and that stable coin will be lended through the YERN protocol. And uh, with the yield generated, with the interest generated from that asset, half of the interest will be given back to the person staking the asset, and the other half will be used to buy and burn UBI. So um, we have a couple of vaults. You can find those on democracy.earth, uh, one for Ether and one for DAI. Uh, the vaults have grown and have contracted throughout time, uh, but you know these vaults are able to buy and burn UBI tokens with yield, uh, which means that you are basically uh, contributing to the project with yield rather than with the asset itself. Uh, so that's a, an interesting way of aligning interests. And it's actually inspired by how the American universities work. Uh, if you look at Harvard or Yale, all of these large universities have an endowment model where they have a, a fund with $500 million worth of assets that generate a 10% yield uh, every year. And with those extra $50 million, they fund the university. Uh, so that thing that works very well for large American universities can be replicated uh, in the blockchain using and composing UBI with uh, YERN or with other DeFi protocols. And uh, we've been talking to, to a bunch of projects in the ecosystem YERN being the first ones that have uh, actually implemented uh, a couple of vaults that use this technique. And we have burned a, a supply of UBI in the past through the through this technique. And, you know, we we have now a, an accrued yield uh, since the last burn that happened in, in during the summer. So uh, it's that's a, a, an interesting asset in and itself to to burn UBI tokens. Um, the other aspect is a. Uh, um, fees from from different protocols. Uh, we have been talking to a, a handful of rollup protocols uh, that are willing to support public goods, and UBI undoubtedly is a public good. Um, so uh, uh, Optimism, uh, which is a rollup, they recently announced that they were willing to commit up to a million dollars uh, 
to support public goods on the Ethereum ecosystem. And they did a quadratic vote to see which uh, projects they would support. And uh, UBI was voted among those. So uh, fees from rollups can be also uh, you know, projects that are willing to support public goods by buying back UBI tokens and burning them. Uh, they they will impact positively the the, the 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 price action of UBI. And last but not least, um, philanthropic donations, of course, uh, like Vitalik did. Vitalik he has bought over initially over fifty ETH worth of UBI tokens and burned them. And he did that that buy through the ETH that he obtained uh, via the Shiv token. So these uh, silly quote unquote dog tokens suddenly have empowered Vitalik to uh, make a, a significant contribution to, to the success of, of UBI. Um, I'm talking to other folks like Vitalik that get it. Uh, I'll be visiting the Bahamas in April uh, to meet with Sam Bankman fried from FTX. Uh, FTX is a, you know, a very successful company in the crypto ecosystem, and Sam is someone willing to support UBI and ideas like that, so hopefully you know, we can all onboard him as well into, into Proof of Humanity and UBI, just like uh, Vitalik did. Uh, and I think that, you know, uh, obviously other prominent figures uh, that have spoken positively about universal basic income, like Elon Musk or uh, Pope Francis or, you know, uh, many other, Jack Dorsey, many other relevant folks, I think that will find this project interesting. You know, and it's a matter of... of you know the community being able to be persuasive enough to get their attention and an interest on how the project works uh but i think you know we are well positioned right now to you know we are pioneering crypto ui so it's it's an interesting place to to be exploring these ideas alongside with our community so in summary nft uh, DeFi, uh roll up fees and uh, yield or philanthropic donations are some of the uh, demand side uh, 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 aspects of how the ecosystem is building around the token or with this constraint of how the UBI smart contract works. Um, one of the, you know, I'm, I'm actually involved right now in a very large, uh, very ambitious uh, metaverse-like project uh, that is using augmented reality uh, projected over the entire planet. Um, the project is called Arret. Uh, you can find it on Twitter. There's not much information online right now. Um, you can find it on uh, at Arretverse. Uh, Arret as in Terra, but written the other way around, uh, like in a mirrored way, um, backwards. Um, and the, this is a very ambitious NFT project that it's exploring how to build uh, metaverses that are... Uh, mapped one-to-one -one with, with the physical locations on the planet. And, uh, you know, we, we are of the belief that, you know, uh, ambitious uh, uh, virtual reality technologies or, you know, uh, next generation user interfaces or, or, or computing interfaces uh, that will go beyond the computer screen will become very relevant as the race of metaverses hits, hits up. Uh, I don't think that metaverses will be this only, uh, the strict property of Facebook Corporation. Open metaverses matter significantly. Uh, we have the extraordinary case of Decentraland, which is probably the most prominent crypto open alternative to Facebook's uh, meta. Uh, but I'm sure that we will see uh, uh, more projects emerge in this direction. And again, like I mentioned before, if you are doing uh, a video game or a metaverse or an experience like that that uh, uses fees to buy back UBI and burn uh, and burn tokens. Uh, you know this this provides a systemic way of generating consistent demand over time. Um, so you you made the calculations throughout the first year of UEI. Uh, I'm happy to tell you that we are already one year old. So the numbers of our first year are very clear in my mind. And during our first year, we had an, an initial supply, which was of 10 million UBI, which uh, half of it was used to, for, the, for the DAO, and the other half was used for a liquidity farming program that we put in place to incentivize uh, providing liquidity on Uniswap to allow uh, transacting the token on Uniswap. The program has been wildly successful. We have 
uh, an average of liquidity of half a million dollars every day on on Uniswap, thanks to to that program. I think that program did, did a, a, provided a good incentive for liquidity providers to to support the, uh, early on UBI. Um, and uh, from that initial supply of 10 million, the uh, total minted tokens, which means tokens that were transacted at least once, uh, uh, was uh, uh, grew uh, uh, up to uh, around 35 million tokens. I think we are right now at the metric of 42, 43 million tokens. Uh, so we basically grew, let's say, uh, uh, 350%. Uh, of 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 uh, no sorry yeah 350 percent of new tokens or 3.5x new tokens were generated in the first year of that initial supply uh, around seven percent of the new tokens were burned uh, so basically uh, in, you know we we know that in a range of 15,000 new users we generated 3.5x more more new tokens in the in the economy of UBI. And of, the, of those new tokens, seven uh, percent uh, got burned. That that burning metric of the percentage of new tokens getting burned, I think that's probably our most uh, relevant KPI. If I were to look into this project from a business perspective, um, if we, if during our second year we can grow that seven percent to twenty percent, uh, or even you know much more aggressive to fifty percent or something like that. Uh, then uh, it will be definitely a very healthy ecosystem uh, in terms of price. Uh, so um, I'm, that's why you know I'm, I'm you know willing to to focus my energy and and my work in in the coming years into building experiences uh, and and services and and uh, technologies that uh, will contribute a percentage of its uh, economic weight. To, to burn the UBI tokens because this this automatically injects into that experience uh, solidarity injects into that experience or into that technology uh, something that is automatically helping uh, you know everyone involved uh, in, in 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 the ecosystem or potentially everyone involved uh, in in you know in a community or in in in, in the world uh, that it's using something like proof of humanity and UBI. So um, I think that, you know, we're moving into a world where we need a more conscious kind of capitalism. Uh, you know, we have seen a, a long debates happening about uh, reducing emissions uh, for, uh, you know, companies that are polluting uh, and, and generating toxic waste. Uh, and uh, I think that with automation, robotics, artificial intelligence and digital entertainment, uh, that is capturing our attention. We also need to have a conversation about that and how these technologies will displace people from their jobs, will remove people from you know the possibility of working. And uh, like Elon Musk said when he launched his fleet of robots, uh, you know it's it would wouldn't be ethical to build a fleet of robots if there's if there isn't some kind of UBI mechanism that will help the the people losing their jobs. Uh, after uh, after the rise of automation and robotics happens, so uh, my you know what I would like to encourage everyone here uh, paying attention to this is that you know that's that's one of the interesting things that that we can build with UBI. We can work with the labor offset uh, rather than the carbon offset that companies and and digital products uh, generate and uh, use the forces of automation in a way that does not uh, uh, keep people away from, from jobs and from the ability to progress, but in a way that actually, you know, uh, helps society at large through through a mechanism uh, that uses crypto UBI. Hey, um, I just want, I, I just want to say that it's very inspiring that you're doing this, this work and uh, I have a few uh, things to say before my follow-up question. I, I said before I had a, a follow-up question. And I, I have the same vision as you because uh, there is around uh, 4 to 5% corporations in China, Singapore, and other Asian countries that are completely automated at this point. And we can see that th this is the future. 
everything is going to be automated. There are a few countries that are going to be completely automated and people, we are going to be out of the job. That's it, like, that's a reality. And um, uh, right now I'm building a game, like you said, you're also working with the game. And we move from the idea of a uh, uh, land uh, real estate metaverse to a hyperstructure. And now I'm moving to a um, for public hyperstructure. I don't want people to pay me to have a house in my hyperstructure. I want them to live in the hyperstructure and be paid to be on it and to play the game. And I think it's a good idea at some point if we, we can connect and we can have maybe the game has a story and maybe in the story they can have uh, uh, the UBI from your uh, token. That's it. We can talk later. And my question is, uh, have you been looking at Canada? It seems like Canada is going to be the first ever country in the world to, to uh, really approve uh, UBI. And have you also been looking in the ideas of hyperstructures that, that are uh, self-sustainable and um, for public? And yeah, it, that's my follow-up question. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm already following you, so happy to, to talk further uh, in the future about what you're building. I'm happy to to support you with with what we had, we, you know, helping you out to implement any kind of skin burning UBI. Sounds like you're building a very interesting project. Project. I'm not familiar with hyperstructures, so you got me intrigued with that, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, um, but uh, yeah, I think you know, governments. Canada has always been like a very progressive government historically, and uh, if you look at the book uh, Utopia for Realists, uh, you will find some very interesting research regarding universal basic income that happened since the, the mid 70s onwards and in some towns in canada they have tested out the idea and they have done some research trying to understand how this can improve people's lives whether or not people would stop working uh, and what kind of uh, impact has on low-income families something like universal basic income um, Right. It's a, you know, governments have to go through a lot of red tape to get the political will to implement something like this. So it's very hard to push through these ideas by the means of traditional governments. And I think that we are left to just wait for them to actually build something like this. Uh, we are going to probably die before something actually happens. Uh, the exciting thing with crypto to me is that we don't need to wait for anyone's permission in order to explore and implement some of these ideas. Like I mentioned with the DeFi protocol that we built that uses yield to buy and burn tokens, um, we, uh, we, you know, if I were to implement something like that in the legacy world, it would be impossible. Like uh, I would have to be born in Connecticut, surrounded by, you know, high class political contacts in the US and get all the favors I could get from, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> through an education in Harvard or an Ivy League university. And maybe just maybe I could implement something like uh, like what we are doing with smart contracts right now. Uh, in crypto, you just sit down, push code, and compose your code with lever leveraging other exciting technologies that can be very handy resources of liquidity. Uh, and uh, you know you just you know very quickly ship cool stuff out there. And uh, throughout the first year of of UBI we were able to you know put some cool stuff uh, out in, in 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 the hands of the community like the humanitarian vaults uh and and some of the nft projects that were you know doing uh, you know building features with, with 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 it i'm very excited about ubi version 2 uh you know this is something that i'm uh, you know actively uh, following very closely uh, the credit should go to my friend juanu who has been contributing and building uh, the, the, this new iteration of the project, uh, you know, very consistently throughout the last uh, few months. And, um, you know, the fact that we will expanding the streaming features of UBI, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's basically significantly increasing the utility of the token. Uh, to f and, and I'm sure that it will find uh, interesting new use cases that will keep, uh, you know, the more useful the token becomes, uh, the, the the stronger the story for its demand uh, will get. And, uh, you know, uh, 
today it's a token that you know why Vitalik has bought so many UBI tokens. Well, I, I think that there's definitely some something there in the sense of you know directly impacting people's lives the way he did is probably the ultimate way of you know donation that you can make uh, in the sense that you know there are no intermediaries and the donation goes straight into people's pockets without any kind of uh, interruption or commission in the middle uh, most philanthropic organizations when they want to send cash to people in africa half of every dollar is wasted through red tape or commissions or banking fees uh, the most efficient ones might get to up to 0.80 cents or 0.90 cents for, for every dollar. Uh, but only crypto uh, is something that directly impacts without intermediaries. And it's 100% of the of every dollar really you know, reaching people's pockets straight uh, from the moment you buy the token. Uh, you know, and, and you see that, that reflected on the price. So uh, obviously, it's a very young project, very new project. Uh, and, you know, like all nascent projects, you know, we need uh, the best uh, of our community to keep on contributing, keep on building, keep on inspiring, evangelizing, teaching, uh, you know, it makes me very happy to see some familiar faces on this space right now. And these are some of the folks that have been contributing and helping with the project since day zero. And, uh, you know, we we have something that a lot of projects lack, and that's uh, a soul, uh, using Vitalik's words. We are a project with a soul, and um, that's that's a consequence of an, a very committed community that has been uh, exploring and experimenting with the project, regardless of price fluctuations and all of those things that might have to make a headline one day. But you know, it's you know, it's really a marathon, and it's a very long race. And we have, I'm definitely sure that we have much more future than than history. In, in what we are building. So um, I'm excited and looking forward to, to what's in store next for, for UBI. Thank you very much, Dee and Santi, for, for this uh, talk. And um, that's uh, that's it, guys. Uh, if you, anybody else has any questions, D, if you wanna uh, I, I will take have over. To, I will have to go to a call now. It's 7.30 yeah, yeah. Yeah. here. Thank you for Thank you for staying uh, for an extra time, Sandy, and answering all these questions. Uh, just, uh, uh, Sandy, you have a minute, right? Like, so I can just ask people to follow you. Yeah. So, guys, uh, thank you all for coming here. Um, just want to say hi to, uh, sorry, thank you to Kino, Vish, Corsesi, Rohit, Akshay, Akshita, Juanu, Julian, all of you guys. I see you. Uh, and thank you. For, uh, if you liked these sessions, if you like these spaces, I do. Uh, these every day. Uh, they call Web3 with D. And if you liked what Santi is doing, uh, please go and follow him. And uh, like, you know, Miro, the easiest way to start is if you have some ETH in your wallet, go get, uh, go on Proof of Humanity uh, and go register there and collect some UBI. You get free money for yourself. Like nothing's wrong with free money. And uh, thank you, Santi, for sharing your journey, sharing your experience and uh, doing good for humanity. Thank you, Dee, for having me. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And and uh, yeah, uh, and everyone that's out there, feel free to follow me. And I usually try to share as much as I can about what's cool happening with the a proof of humanity and UBI community and, and yeah, looking forward to keep having this conversation on, on Twitter moving forward. Awesome. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.